Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Marriage and Kinship. We are busy looking at some alternative models of kinship and taking them really seriously and trying to see what they're all about. So today we're going to hop over to Malaysia and talk about how kinship is a process. So previously, we talked about how because ideas about the family are culturally constructed and historically particular, they are not fixed. They can be altered. But what we're adding today is the idea that not only can our ideas be altered in a historical sense, but our identities as members of families can be unfixed and changeable throughout people's lives. And also we're going to be talking about the fact that generally societies have ways of creating new kin relationships. When we make our charts, we imagine somebody being born into a position in the chart and then they're just there, right? But, um, you know, when you perhaps marry somebody, you become a part of their chart, for example. Um, kinship is not actually as fixed as our techniques for representing family ties. So in Langkawi, Malaysia, according to Janet Karsten, kinship is about shared substance, shared physical substance, especially blood, but also milk. And by milk, I mean breast milk. In Langkawi, at the time that Karsten was doing her research, it was very common for women who were lactating to feed other children because, you know, you have a baby, that baby is hungry, that baby's crying, you have food right here, you get out the food, you, um, you hold that baby to your breast and you feed it. So children who have nursed from the same woman are kin by virtue of that shared milk and by extension kinship is based on food as a shared substance and if you're just thinking about this for the first time and you haven't read the article yet that probably sounds weird but stay with me first of all i want to ask you is this biological or social because sharing food is something that we usually understand as social. Um, taking care of other people's children is something that we understand as social. Sharing blood is something that we understand as biological. So do the people of Langkawi have a biological or social idea about kinship? And I also want to ask you, and please feel free to talk about this in the comments, is, is the need to distinguish between biological and social an ethnocentric Western peculiarity? If I, as an anthropologist from the West, from the US, feel like I have to know if something is biological or social, am I being ethnocentric and weird and not looking beyond my own culture. But breastfeeding and foster care practices, this is also a society in which it's very common to send your child to go live with another family for a while, along with these local beliefs mean that many people can be considered related to each other in ways that cannot be accounted for with kinship charts, like how do you chart milk siblings? If you can figure it out, let me know. This leads Karsten to be really dissatisfied with this static chart-based model of kinship. And so she wants us to think about relatedness instead. 
And she defines relatedness as indigenous ways of acting out and conceptualizing relations between people as distinct from notions derived from anthropological theory. When we are actually with people and learning about their lives, maybe we should actually throw the anthropological theory in the trash and instead start from indigenous understandings of relationships. She also says that ideas about relatedness in Langkawi show how culturally specific is the separation of the social from the biological and the reduction of biological to sexual reproduction. In Langkawi, relatedness is derived both from acts of procreation and from acts of living and eating together. It makes little sense in indigenous terms to label some of these activities as social and others as biological. I certainly never heard Langkawi people do so. So here I'm going to do something really uncommon and I'm going to give Levi Strauss a little bit of credit because if you remember back earlier in the semester, we talked about this phrase that he has that man is both a biological and social being. Humans have society and culture as part of just the way we are biologically. (laughs) And so can we really ever separate them? Karsten suggests that maybe it's better to not try or that the need to try is based on a particular understanding of the world that Westerners have inherited, but that other people don't really care about. So how can eating food together be biological? Let's talk about blood, heat, and cooking. Because Langkawi beliefs about kinship do make sense in the larger context of how they understand the world to work. So what is blood? What is heat? How does it affect people's bodies? How does it affect food? How does it affect um, the world? About how sexuality works, about how marriage works, pregnancy, cooking, like all of these things are entangled with each other. So houses in Langkawi have one hearth per home. Members of the household return home for meals. So um, dinner parties are probably not a thing that people do there as a social activity. You can have snacks elsewhere, but a full meal with rice is something that you have to go back home for. The most important kin relationship isn't parent-child, it's siblingship, and marriage is in fact modeled on ideal sibling relationships between brother and sister. Of course, brother and sister wouldn't get married, (laughs) but rather the way brothers and sisters should relate to each other is also conceptualized as a good way for husbands and wives to relate to each other. And it's very easy to acquire sibling-like relationships to people because sharing food and living in the same house together is enough to make people closely enough related for their marriages to be incestuous. So not just genetic siblings, but people who have become your siblings by virtue of having nursed from the same woman or sharing food in a house, they are also not people you can marry. Because all of this is fundamentally derived from, it is the idea that women give blood at conception, what women are imagined to contribute to the child is blood. And if you think about it, this is perfectly reasonable because the way that conception works, right, 
is you have a sperm and you have an egg and the sperm gets devoured by the egg and incorporated into it and the cells start dividing and it turns into an embryo and it travels down the fallopian tubes and into the uterus which has this lovely soft blood lining that that embryo can burrow into and grow into a zygote and then a fetus and then eventually a child so the idea that women give blood at conception is pretty reasonable actually um so women give blood to children they give birth to children and create relationships that way they give milk to children through breastfeeding both their own children that they have given birth to and other children that they have taken responsibility for in some way. And then women also cook food. So sharing relationships to this kind of maternal figure in your life will make you somebody's sibling, in effect. Blood in particular, again, if you think about it, this is a perfectly reasonable biological claim. So blood in particular is continuously produced and transformed from food that is eaten. You know that you have to be continuously producing blood, right? Because, you know, you can't die from a little cut. <laughs> Like, when you get a little cut, it's fine. You lose a little bit of blood, and then your body makes it up, right? Where does it get the raw materials to make new blood from? From the nutrients in the food you eat. <laughs> so this is a totally correct biological idea. Blood can therefore be altered by the food that you eat. This is also true, right? Um, you can have an iron deficiency if you're not eating enough iron, and that affects your blood and gives you anemia. So blood can be altered. It can be shared. The food can be shared. Blood can also be shared and consumed in turn with varying effects. So as a result of these beliefs about blood, we also see other beliefs that follow logically from the idea that blood is continually produced and transformed, and that therefore people who are eating the same food have the same blood. So siblings need blood transfusions from a non-relative because the blood of siblings is the same, so it's not going to work. There are taboos on eating food that is in the house when someone dies in the house. That food is then contaminated with dead blood. Not literally. <laughs> um, spiritually. In, in essence, contaminated with the blood of the person who died. You have to throw all that food out because you don't want to eat the blood that is all over that food. And also, murderers who drink blood from their victims gain superhuman abilities. And so what we see from all of these ideas is that both biological and social identities as siblings, as members of a family, are unfixed and alterable. You can become siblings with someone by living together and eating the same food. Presumably, if you move house and start eating different food, then you would gain new sets of relationships. So what this brings us back to is this idea that kinship isn't something that you're born into and then you're stuck there in one place on the chart. Kinship is a process. And this is why it is useful to talk about relatedness. Relatedness takes us out of that chart framework. And so relatedness can help us understand the process of determining who you are related to and how and why. It can help us talk about gaining new relations and becoming estranged from people. It can help us talk about the process of joining families and processes of becoming related in a broader sense. So thank you very much for sticking with me and I will talk to you next time.